Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, as uh, Alex said, I'm Caleb. I'm lead pastor here. If this is your first time with us this morning, we'd really like to welcome you. Uh, thanks, Mom, for clapping. Um, it's always nice when I have one fan in the crowd. Um, no, uh, welcome to our church. Uh, if you're wondering what is the vineyard uh, or a, a vine yard, as some people say, um, you know, we're just, uh, we're just a group of people that are trying to be like Jesus. And we uh, have uh, two priorities in our midst, and it's uh, uh, to look at the Word of God and to value and uphold the Word of God with our lives, but also to be led and be obedient to the voice of the Spirit. Um, one of the, those, like we bring those two things together in our midst. Um, and I'd say we have a pretty good time, don't we? Yep, okay, so... There's a few satisfied, satisfied customers out there. Um, if you brought your Bible with you this morning, uh, open to Ezra chapter 7 and Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm going to look at both of these uh, passages in uh, sort of no direct order. I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, oh, well, look, I found a piece of gum. That's cool. <laughs> I started hiding gum in my Bible because uh, I used to hide it in my pants and then it would like get in the washer and that would be awful. Um, we started this uh, series last week uh, and, you know, the book of Ezra, and I, I'm going to call it one book, it's two books in your Bible, uh, but uh, it was written as, as one book and uh, it actually is, is kind of kind of odd because there's Ezra Ezra is one of those books that it less than half of it actually has to do with the person that it's named after um, and Ezra actually shows up more kind of more in Nehemiah than he does in his own book um, but uh, Ezra the book of Ezra's dominant you know character isn't really uh, named in the title and that's because his name is Zerubbabel you know, and that if his name, if the book was named after Zerubbabel, it would, I'm telling you, it would be like the most famous book in all of the Bible. Um, so maybe that's why it's not that. But um, last week, you know, we, we talked about this, this idea that the, the two books together, they're one book, and they carry this theme of, of rebuilding. And um, it marks a very sort of pivotal moment in the, the life of Israel as a, as a people because um, the prophets, you know, after they came out of exile or the exodus and they took over the land, um, the, the judges and the prophets of God were telling them, hey, those practices that you're taking on of those people around you, uh, they're going to end up causing you a whole lot of trouble. And uh, they wouldn't listen. They were, you know, as God says uh, several times over again, they were a stiff-necked people. Um, and they were stubborn in their ways and they were rebellious. And eventually what happened is their, their stubbornness and their idolatry and their, their sinful practices, um, they, they ended up getting, like, taken over. God, and God told them this was going to happen. Like, you, like, you're going to get to a point where... Uh, I'm going to rise up the nations around you and they're going to, they're going to come in and they're going to crush you. They're going to carry you off. And they did that. The Babylonians did that. Um, and if you read the book of Daniel, that whole, uh, you know, or Lamentations, the book of Lamentations is set within the destruction of Jerusalem. It's Jeremiah's account of Jerusalem's destruction. And it really is actually like a, a book of darkness. Um, so in that myth, you know, D Jerusalem gets destroyed. They get carried off by Babylon. Um, while they're in Babylon, the, it says that the Lord rose up another nation to destroy Babylon. Uh, and that was uh, the Persian Empire. So the Persian Empire comes in. Uh, and at that moment, there's this prophecy in Jeremiah that Jeremiah says, after 70 years of, of being in captivity, the Lord is going to bring you back. And, and in that, that context, this is Jeremiah's prophecy, that you, you're going to go from a, Jerusalem's going to go from a big pile of rubble to, to a great revival. 
And, and that's, the, that's the, the, the context of Ezra and Nehemiah. It is basically you know, taking a pile of rocks and rebuilding it into a holy city and a holy people. And uh, within the book, there's so many great principles for us. It's, it's interesting to me that uh, out of all of the books of the Bible that get quoted in the New Testament, Ezra and Nehemiah just don't exist. But when it comes to the Christian life, if we look at it and examine it as a whole, we can see several principles that really do apply to our life and, and the, the context of being a kingdom people. And this is what it looks like to be a kingdom person. And last week, you know, this, the first step of being a, a kingdom builder is to know exactly what God wants you to do with your life, right? Well, remember, you were here last week, some of you? Yeah? No? If you weren't here, you can check it online. Um, it's a really great message. I really like the speaker. He's a really good guy. Um, let's see, where was I? You know, in our life, I, so last week we talked about the, one of the ways that we really learn to discover God's purpose for our life. Um, this week I'm going to zone in on two other ways. It's sort of a continuation of last week. Um, but uh, for the sake of, of uh, recap, I am going to revisit something I said last week because um, as I was thinking about it, like, this, this is such a big thing that I really, like, I really want us to understand what is happening um, inside of, uh, let's just call it Christian culture. Right? So, like, when we talk about call or what am I called to or um, what, what task am I, am I to do or what am I to do with my life or purpose, like, there's, there's a broad range of words that we use. And it usually all sort of comes back to this idea of, like, you know, this central word of call. And then we apply that universally across our lives. And we say, well, you know, I'm called to this and I'm not called to that. And we sort of become very um, microscopic with the word. But the, the problem with that is um, that the word call isn't necessarily to be used in sort of a microscopic sense. Um, that is a, what I would call an issue of, of grammar. And, and that's sort of actually bad grammar. My, my daughter, um, you gotta be careful, she's sitting here. Um, she doesn't like it when I talk about her. Uh, a child that I know. Um, one day, uh, came to me and said, um, hey, Dad, um, or mm, excuse me, sir. <laughs> excuse me, sir. Uh, can, I, can I go outside? And I said, yeah, but you got to get your shoes on. And then they responded, uh, but I want to go bare on my feet um, outside. And I, I heard the statement, and, and you hear the statement, and you kind of get like, oh, I get, what, I get what they're trying to say, right? But that's not the way that we say it, right? And that's a, that's a, that's a grammar problem. That's something that as you mature, um, you, you sort of work those things out. And uh, now, now my, my son's doing it too, where he's sort of you know, learning phrases and he's at that, that point where uh, he, makes, he makes a statement and I, I, have to, I have to switch all the words around to be able to, to process the proper grammar. Like this is the way that we would say this. Now, being a good dad, I don't, you know, take him outside and, you know, flog him for that. So, um, but I just, I accept that this is, this is a mistake that, that children make. And also, in the church, I, I think the same thing is true. One of the things that, that I've learned as I really study the Bible is that it really is kind of a set of grammatical rules. Like, if you look at the Bible as a, as a whole book, like, there's, a, there's things that the Bible says and there's things that the Bible points to, and we sort of grab onto these principles as, as Christ followers, and we just, we, like, calling. We'll use it in a sense where it's not really the right way to use it, but we know exactly kind of what each other means. And our brain sort of work, reworks the sentence to go, oh, yeah, I know what you're trying to say. The problem is that there's, there, the more mature you get in, in the Lord, the more you can sort of decipher what it is. But the, uh, the issue is, 
that those who are less mature, when you start using these big words, these like calling or purpose, you, they, they don't know the grammar. You understand? You get me? You're tracking with me? They don't know, they don't know the grammar. And so, because they don't know it, they're, they're going to use it in sort of an improper sense. And calling is definitely one of those words that we repeatedly uh, use. And uh, this is where, you know, so when we use the word calling, we kind of use it in a confusing sense. Um, the one thing that people do the most is that they take their sense of calling and they attach it to something that they do. They, they attach it to a, uh, a function. They, they attach it to something that they're, they're doing in this present moment. And then what happens is, is this, this thing sort of runs its course and it, it goes bye-bye and then they've, because they've attached their calling, which really gives us a sense of identity, they've attached their identity to what they do. When they don't do that thing anymore, they have an identity crisis. It happens. Actually, I see a lot with uh, uh, guys who enter into retirement. Like they, they spend you know, probably like two years uh, trying to figure out who they are. Because for all of our life, in our Western American context, we, we directly associate our identity with our job. Those two things are like, they're just, in our sense, they're, they're co-equal. And they're not co-equal. What you do is not who you are. They're, they're not the same thing. Who you are and who God has called you to be is much higher and much, much broader than the job that you're performing in this very moment. The, an interesting, here's an interesting thing. The Levites, right? The, the tribe of Levi, the people who were assigned in, uh, at the Sinai mountain, uh, you guys are going to be the ones that are going to be the priests, Okay? If you go to Numbers chapter 8, one of the things that you'll see, it says to the, the, the Levites, hey, at the age of 25, you start your priesthood, but at 50, guess what? You're done. Your job is actually the next thing. You cannot, it actually, it's very specific. Your job is not to, to, to be, you know, Standing in the temple and offering the sacrifices, uh, you become a guard and the next generation comes in. God's actually wrote into his book, Retirement. Interest, you know, somebody, somebody told me once that uh, uh, it was a retiring pastor that uh, uh, told me, he goes, uh, you know, retirement is not in the Bible. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> have you read Numbers chapter 8? Because it actually is a concept. Anyway, so what happens in, in our, our world is we, we associate um, our identity with our job. And then the job kind of can, like, we can get fired. Like one day you can just walk in and get laid off. And then you're like, boom, you're done. Um, what do you do in that sense? And that's the, that's the trouble that we have with, you know, cr associating those two things. And that is, a, that, is a, that is a very American thing. It's a very Western sort of individual thing. If I ask you to describe yourself, one of the things that you're probably going to first tell me is what, where you work and what it is that you do there. Um, outside of our culture, the world is actually completely different. And uh, you ask somebody who they are, uh, one of the first things that they're going to tell you is who their family is, who it is that they're associated with, their relationships, what they, who they are in the context of their family. You know? And that's, a, that's actually the, the context of the Bible. The Bible is set in that, that worldview. Uh, so this, is a, this actually is an American thing that we have. The other problem that we have with the sense of calling is not just the fact that we identify uh, our job with our identity, but... In the church world as a whole, because we can associate those two things together, unhealthy leaders will take the, the principle of calling and job and associate them together so that they can manipulate you to do what you, they want you to do. 
And if you're here today and that's happened where you've, you've had a leader of a church or a ministry say to you, hey, what you're doing or what I want you to do is your calling. And if you don't do that, then you're in disobedience with God and um, you're going to pay the, pre- the penalty price for that. If that's happening, I'm sorry. That's a, that's a, a bad grammar, really. That is an improper understanding of calling and they've used whatever it is that they thought was your calling over your life to manipulate you and to abuse you and I'm sorry it happened. That's that's a, a terrible use of the word. That is like the worst of the worst of the worst that one can use that. So... One of the things that, like, I mean, it's like this, this would all, if we would, if we would really kind of ad- adapt to a, a clear understanding of calling, we can sort of begin to go, oh, like, um, I, I saw somebody do that abusive thing once, and um, I, I was, I just didn't know what to say at that point in my life, because I was not mature enough to really understand uh, the difference between the uses of calling, and it's basically a macro to a micro type of situation here. Um, but had I known, had I been more mature and understood exactly how the Bible uses calling, I would have actually thrown the flag and say, actually, I don't think that what you're saying here is who they are as an identity is going to be in disobedience. I would have said, what you really mean to say is that their, the assignment that they don't want to do anymore is up and they're going to move on. Nothing has changed about their calling. That's a healthier way to say, I would call them, anyway, anyway, that would have been a conversation that we would have had, I would have had with that leader. Um, so let's clarify this. So just, I, I, I said this last week, um, it's kind of going to be a revisit, but um, I wanted to put it up on the screen so that you could visualize it. Um, and I think it's also in the notes that are online too. Um, one of the ways that the Bible uses calling, and this is, you know, like I said, macro to micro. We're going to work from the broadest stroke down to the finest stroke um, as far as paintbrushes go. The, the broadest sense, and this is the, the macro sense, is that um, you have a very general calling, right? Like, uh, if you understand the different types of revelation that are in the Bible, there's general revelation, which is, you know, God, you know, uh, he has revealed himself through all of creation, and then there's special revelation where God is is actually self-identifying. You see this first in the book of Exodus and beyond, where God really actually begins to to lay out his, his, his traits, right? So you get a broad, and then you start working down. This is where we're going to work at. So, um, in the macro sense, we're called to Christ. When we think about calling, you say, what am I called to? Well, the writers of the New Testament would have, you know, first and foremost, before they ever talked about anything that they were doing uh, way down here, they would have pointed first to Christ. And they, they actually, they do this. Uh, as Christians, we're called to Christ and we're called to the way of Jesus. You know, that, that should be, if you ever are asked, hey, what, what is it that you're called to? Well, first, first and foremost, I am called to Jesus. I, I have, when I was baptized, I have, have given my whole life to Jesus, and he owns it. It's his to do what he wants to with, and I have given everything to him. And I'm following him. Now, whatever I follow him to, that may be a different story. But the first step is that I am following Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. It says, he tells his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, guess what? He finds it. So Jesus, first when he says, 
talks about our call. Like we're called to him. We're called to follow him. Paul picks this up when he tells the Corinthians, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. In Ephesians, he would later say, therefore, guys, be imitators of God as beloved children. As his beloved children. So our calling in the very broadest sense of the, the term is to follow him. Peter echoes this, at, uh, echoes uh, what Moses told the Israelites at Sinai when he declares in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we are a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. What's our calling? Well, we're called to Christ. We're called to follow Christ. Now, the end... The next layer of this, the, the step down, is the, what I call the middle view. And that's where our identity uh, is found in a sense of calling. So we have a broad general calling, and then we have uh, sort of a, a special calling, right? This is what we're about. This is, I could say, this is the trajectory of my lifetime. For me, um, I, I said this last week. I know it probably shocked some of you. Like he, I was never called to be a pastor, I, when in 22 years old, uh, in the, the nation of Mozambique, I, I had an encounter with the Lord uh, where he asked me seven times, uh, will I serve him? And he said, will you serve me? Will you serve me? Seven times he, he said, will you serve me? And I said, yes, Jesus, I will serve you. And over and over and over again, I said, yes, Jesus, I will serve you. I, I feel like in that time, I wasn't called to be a pastor or called into ministry. I was just called to be a servant of the Lord. And that is like, if you ask me, hey, Caleb, what is the trajectory of your life? Is I'm just, I'm here to serve Jesus in whatever capacity he tells me to. I follow him. He gives me my marching orders. He's my commanding officer. Whatever he says to go and do, I'm going to go do. Sometimes that's specific. Uh, I want you to, you know, go to, I once, I once like was praying one day and I felt like the Lord said, I want you to take groceries to, um, and he gave me a specific address. And I thought, well, this is weird. Um, but I had a grid for it. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. You said to do it. And so I take a bag of groceries. I show up at this door. I knock on it. And, and uh, they open the door. And um, I said, hey, I was praying. I've, this is going to sound weird. This is like, I mean, I just like, I've, I use that statement a lot. This is going to sound weird. Um, it's part of my just wanting to be kind of a normal, like, everyday Christian, like, I, I know some people may not have a grid for this, but I'm like, look, this is going to sound weird, but I was praying, and I felt like the Lord said to, to show up here. In all humility, this is what I feel. Um, and uh, they said, I said, do you need some groceries? And they said, actually, we do. And so I opened, they opened the door, they let me in, and um, I, I put the groceries on the table, and I said, um, uh, so yeah, I just you know wanted to come and bless you guys, and I felt like the Lord said this, and uh, this guy the whole time he's sitting in his easy chair and his mouth is just like wide open, like like just staring at me, like just jaw drop, and um, and and finally after a few minutes, like before I get ready to leave, I ask him like, is there anything that I can pray with you about? And uh, he goes, so tell me again how you found your way here. I well I was praying and I just felt like I like the Lord told me to come here it was just like I was just being obedient and um, his wife looks at him and, and says see, see I think his name is Bob see Bob I told you this prayer thing works <laughs> they were praying I said so what's that about they were praying for they were praying for a provision from the Lord and lo and behold God sends Caleb from Beaver Creek into East State and that's like Sometimes for me that happens. Like I look, whatever the assignment, whatever the assignment is, I go with it. All right? But in the middle view, my identity is just to be a servant, to be a vessel for, for God's goodness into the world. That was the yes that I gave Jesus. Paul, if you look at the writings of Paul, you'll see this throughout the New Testament. You'll see... Um, 
in his, his greetings. Like whenever Paul writes a, a book, there's only like one or two times where he doesn't do this. Whenever he writes a, 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 a letter to a church or to a person, he starts it with a particular phrase. And that phrase is really like his identity statement. He's, he's saying you know, in several sen- senses, he says, I'm a servant of God. He calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. Uh, and Philemon, he calls himself a prisoner. Uh, that's my favorite. Of all Paul's, Paul's callings, it's the prisoner. There's so many people who are like, I just want to be called to ministry. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? Understand Paul's usage of that word. Um, Peter calls himself an apostle of Christ. James, when he writes the book to the church of the diaspora, he says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he didn't say, I'm Jesus' brother. Huh? Yeah, Okay. He said, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John, uh, he calls himself, in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he doesn't write anything about himself. And even in the Gospel of John, he doesn't really preface that book, which he's writing to his church in Ephesus. Um, he, uh, he later, throughout the, throughout the book, he refers to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. I love that. I, I just If I'm going to write a Gospel one day, I'm going to, I'm going to put that in there. So in the middle view, like you get this, like this, what is the trajectory of your life? Now, the, the danger here is that we can start associating this, this broad sort of, you know, general middle ground with our, our giftings. Now, Paul, Paul does this. He calls himself an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to have a sidebar conversation on that first, okay, the, before we can go on. In the Bible, in the New Testament, Paul uses two words for, for gift, okay? Um, some gifts, which like he would classify his apostolic gifting uh, as well as the other apostolic leaders in the, the New Testament, he would, he would classify as uh, what he uses the doma. That's the word doma. And it, it means gift, and it's used specifically in Ephesians chapter 4. And he uses it in the context of the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists. They are, and he says this specifically, they are Christ's gift to the church. If you know people, and I, I do think that they are, you're going to probably ask me, are those still around? Like, Yes, but not in the sense not in the sense of still writing scripture and the apostles and prophets. They're not pr- producing and generating more works of the the canon. The canon is closed. Um, and, but if you you know people who have an apostolic gifting, one of the things that you know about them is that they're really good at starting stuff. They're just they're like you could you could interchange that word with like a pioneer. Like they are they are pioneering things in the kingdom of God. And so in that sense, like that, that gift is still alive and active. I know people who um, have, uh, a friend of mine has planted um, 20 some thousand churches across uh, Africa. Um, I have another friend who has, um, he has, uh, he's had direct influence on people that uh, have seen over a million people come to Christ, each one of them, over a million people come to Christ. And, and that's, a, that's amazing. And has had a direct influence on the planting of uh, nearly 100,000 churches across the world. So I, I know these people, they're just amazing. Like there's just startup people. They're just, they're amazing. So, but one of the things that I know about that gift is that the gift comes in the context of really a divine sovereign moment where it's that person has an encounter with the risen Christ. Like they just talk to him and you, you, can, like you can tell, like just talk to him. They, you hear their story and they'll tell you that Jesus appeared to me and such and such. But um, after you spend some time with him, you're like, wow, I think actually what I was a little skeptical of, like that actually may be a real thing. You really did encounter Christ. And so the doma is birthed out of that. Now the other word that Paul uses is charis, which is in the context of this is the, these are the gifts that Jesus empowers us to use through the Holy Spirit so that thanksgiving and praise can be given to God. The doma is more of an arc trajectory type of thing. The, the charismata, 
the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you see in, in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, those are, those are the gifts that the Spirit gives each of us individually used in the context of the church and also out into the community. And they bring praise and thanksgiving to God. Um, and I, some people would argue that they're sort of a temporary thing that the Holy Spirit gives us those in the moment. So anyway, it's part of a broader conversation. Um, so in the, the former sense, in the Doma sense, like the, that can be a trajectory of someone's life. If you had an encounter with God that uh, sort of led to, to the, the gifting, the Doma, uh, that could be an, an arc of your life, but that is not universal. I'll tell you that. That's not a universal thing. Um, the, the, the rest of us, we're, we're just simply being used by the Holy Spirit in the midst of the context. And those things, those things are not our identities. They're just part of our Christian life. They're what the Holy Spirit gives us just for, for praising his name and, and, and believing that the, the Spirit actually animates us as, as believers and uses us in the world and in the body. That's not our identity other than the fact of just being called a Christian. That's what it means. Little Christ. So if you look through the Bible, you look at like Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Paul and so on and so on and so on. Those are very unique situations. And into the modern world, um, people who carry those types of giftings are also sort of unique. Moving on, most narrow view, the micro view is that each and every one of us, we have specific assignments that the Lord wants to, to do through our lives. It's what Paul calls a good work when he, in Ephesians chapter two, he says in verse eight, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, this is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. The good work here is the kingdom action. Another way to say it is that God has, God has from, from the beginning, when he looked at your life, he said, you know what? I have some good deeds for you to do. I have some, some ways for you to be my conduit of, of my love into the world and my new creation that I'm bringing through Christ into the world. I'm going to use your life. These are the good works. And I, I think when we talk about um, our calling versus what it is that we're doing, we ought to distinguish. I, I wish like if I could have a conversation with every believer around the world, or at least in the United States, this is what I would say. When you use calling, think about what it is like the general trajectory of your life. But when you talk about what it is that you're doing, talk about your assignment, talk about the good work. Because there is a, there's a big difference. There's a large gap between those two things. At this point in my life, I'm pastoring a church. That's my assignment. This is my post. You ever, you ever watch uh, Dances with Wolves? This is going to date me. Anybody? Some of you are like, what's that movie? Never heard of it. Um, there's a scene in the movie where uh, Kevin Costner, a very young Kevin Costner, he goes all the way out to this fort where he was assigned and... Uh, the, the guy who takes all his stuff out there says, look, we need to turn around and go back. There's nobody here. Everybody's dead. Let's just go back to civilization. And, and Kevin Costner, he tells him time after time after time, unload the wagon. I'm staying. And, uh, and finally, he, like after this guy was trying to convince him, like, let's, let's go back. He pulls, his, he pulls his sidearm and he puts it in the guy's face. He says, no, this is my post and I'm staying. Like some of you, retired military officers, you, you, military, you understand that. Uh, us civilians is a hard thing to sort of grasp. Like, but, but that is like when we talk about what it is that Jesus wants us to do with our lives, we receive our marching orders from him. We receive our post from him. He's going to give us an assignment. He has an assignment. And you may not be living in any type of assignment, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have an assignment. He does. He has a good work for you. 
He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for your life. Okay? We have to figure it out what it is. Last week we talked about how in Zerubbabel, he was sent to build the temple. And now I'm going to get to Ezra and Nehemiah. You're looking at the clock. You're like, is he going to do this enough time? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm landing in the plane. Put your seatbelt on. <laughs> Zerubbabel was sent to rebuild the temple. The first thing he does is rebuild the, the altar of sacrifice and restores temple worship. Um, how did he get that good work? How did he discover that? Well, it came through what I would call a prophetically inspired proclamation. This is go back to the charismata, right? So we go back to the charismata. There's, there's people among us that they, they have a prophetic gifting. And, and, and it's like, I know what you're thinking, like prophetic, like is this like, you know, fortune telling? No, it's not. Actually, the essence of prophetic is really a partnership with God. It's saying what he's saying. It's, it's learning to discern what it is. What it is. It, Psalm 139 says that God's thoughts about us, if we were to count them, they would outnumber the, the grains of sand on the seashore. And so what we can draw from that is that he is always thinking about us. He always has thoughts. He's always speaking things over us. And what we are, can do is we can discern what it is that he's saying. We can discern for other people what it is that he's saying. What it is that... that you know, he's assigning to you. And sometimes in our lives, um, our assignment really can come through proclamation. I've seen this several times. Um, but usually, I'll just give you one, one more piece of this puzzle. Usually, God will say something to you, and then he will say it to two or three other people. Just will. And I know this because it's, he does it to me. He'll give me a word about something and I'm like, oh, okay, all right, I'm just gonna sit on that. And then there's like two or three other people who will go, I was praying for you the other day and I felt like I, the, the, the Spirit said this. And it's right in line. It's, it's in alignment with what the Lord has already spoken. He's not going to share something with somebody else that he really hasn't began to, to work on your heart in the arena of, right? You get that? Okay. So that's Zerubbabel. The next one is uh, Ezra. Ezra, his mission is to reestablish the Mosaic law in Israel. Uh, because of the exile, they were living as, as foreigners in a kind of a strange land, a foreign land. They were taken into captivity. Um, you see in the book of Daniel that there's this tension that exists for those who are in exile of trying to remain ritually pure and for those who are not. You know, uh, most often what was happening uh, in the, the, the exile is that the Israelites were, were taken off into a land and they would, they would struggle with their their national identity and they would begin to take on some of the practices of uh, the, the world around them. Uh, if you look at the book of Esther, the Esther's a great example of this. Um, it really actually probably shock you to, to know this, but Esther doesn't really mention God. <laughs> I find that funny. You might not find that funny, but I find that like kind of funny. Um, but it's, it's like even the name Esther, like she, she was truly rooted in Persian culture. The whole book is like, it's all around about the, the culture of Persia and how she is just sort of living in that midst. And so there was this, this tension that exists for those who are in captivity, either take on the culture or not. And Daniel doesn't, he resists the culture. Um, so back to the law of Moses, and this really kind of stems from, you know, this whole thing, that the law of Moses wasn't really held in high value. It wasn't, the, the Torah wasn't, uh, wasn't taught in the, the captivity. It wasn't uh, passed amongst the, the people. And so in order to come back from uh, captivity into their own land, they had to actually reestablish 
the teaching of Moses. If they were going to go from rubble to revival, the law of Moses, the word of God, was going to be pivotal to them. And so you get Ezra. Ezra, it says in chapter 7, says this, after these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Merath, the son of Zerah. Do you get this? That's, that's four verses. Like, what is he doing? What on earth... <laughs> Sometimes you read names in the Bible and you're like, what is there to learn from this? And this is, remember what I said about the culture. The, the person, you ask them who they are, they're going to tell you about their family. Who's Ezra? Well, he's telling you about his family. And it doesn't, it's sort of like actually like, it's for me, I, I sort of like, I start reading these names and I gloss over and then eventually what you do is you, f you see a name that you recognize and you go through Uzi, Buki, Abishua and then Feinhaus. Feinhaus. Like, oh, I know Feinhaus. Feinhaus is the guy that um, when Israel was camped at Peor and they started worshiping uh, Baal, uh, he goes and he cleanses the camp. He was, a, he was a zealot as who he was. He, was, he actually was known as the protector of, of Israel. And any time there was any type of, you know, when Israel was in the wilderness, any time there was any trouble with idolatry, they would call Feinhaus, and Feinhaus would, would be called out with his army, and he would basically was going to set them all straight. And then Eleazar, oh, I know Eleazar. He was the one son of Aaron who lived because Aaron's other two sons, as they were giving worship to the Lord, they were, uh, they were fooling around and the fire caught on them and they burned to death. So Eleazar is the only one who was righteous. This is his family. Right? So then it goes on to say, he was a teacher, Ezra was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king had granted him everything he asked for, for the hand of the Lord, his God, was on him. And for verse 10 says this, for Ezra had devoted himself to the study of the observance of the law of the Lord and to the teaching, its decrees and laws in Israel. So what can we learn from that? about discovering God's plan for our life. Well, one, there is something to be said about education and whatever your heart, you know, sort of stirs you in the realm of getting an education. That might be the Lord speaking to you about going in that direction. But one of the, one of the things that I really take away from this is that we, we can discover we can discover what the good works that God has for us through our kingdom family. Not our natural born family. Not as in like taking up the family business. But looking around this place. What is it that my church family is doing? What is it that I can begin to get engaged with that might just lead me to the good work that Jesus has for me. See, it's like sometimes we're, we're so focused in on like, oh, I'm just looking for, I'm just looking for, you know, God to give me a sign so that he can tell me what it is that he wants you to do. And then you walk in the lobby and you, you see a sign that says, children's volunteers needed. And you go, oh, that's not it. Maybe it's in another part of the building. I mean, this is, but this is the, this is the thing. Like, that you, you learn to, to, to discover how God is going to use you in the context of, of the family. Try, find a ministry area in the, in the midst of our church and, and begin serving. And you may go, oh, yeah, that's not, probably not for me. Or you may find, you know what? I, I, just, I just love holding babies 
And I didn't know I'd enjoy this so much. You find, you find what God has for you to do through the church, through the family. If you've never been on an outreach with us, go. Go, go spend a Saturday morning for a couple hours giving groceries away to people who, who need it and pray for them. Bless them, encourage them. You, you can discover in that the whole context, a whole world of good works that Jesus might have for you. Amen? So, not saying take up the family business, become a teacher of the law of Moses. I'm saying take a long look around. You know, there's a, there's a group of people who meet, I think the second Saturday of every month, that they just come in and clean stuff. And they do this periodically. Some of you are just like, you just love to clean. You, you love to clean. You need to make some friends with those folks. They love to clean. They cleaned our coffee bar a while back. God bless them. Looks amazing. The second way, and this is my last point. Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the most famous of the three guys of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and then you find Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is famous for um, rebuilding the wall. He went to Jerusalem. Uh, the king, Artaxerxes, sent him with a, a whole load of goods to repair the wall. Wood, stone, gold, all sorts of stuff. And Ezra's the guy, or Nehemiah's the guy. Now, Nehemiah didn't have a visitation. He didn't grow up in a family that had any type of, of lineage. He was just a cupbearer for the king. And one day, some friends who'd come visiting from Jerusalem walked in and he asked about Jerusalem, hey, what's, what's the city like? And they told him, the walls are destroyed. The gates are on fire. The city is a war zone. And what you see in Nehemiah was that the Lord began, through that report, to stir his heart. And if, if you are looking for the good work that, has, that God has for you, Getting a pulse on your heart is key. Understanding, what it, like when you hear or see something happening in the world and your heart begins to break for a group of people or for a person, that just might be a sign from God that he wants to use you in this area or that area or to bless this person or that person. I call it the ministry of neighboring. You may hear somebody in your neighborhood that's, that's, that's struggling, that's suffering, and what you don't know where to begin, but you, you feel a sense of like, I gotta do something. I'll tell you where to begin. Bake some cookies. Just bake some cookies. Buy a plant. And walk across the road. It's that simple. Some of you might be like, and this probably is, is rare amongst us, there's, there's probably more than a few that like you, you, feel, you feel a burden in your heart for a nation or a people group. And you're like, what do I do with that? Like you, just, you feel just a, a sense of like, I need, I need to go and need to do something. Well, get a passport. That's the first step. If you want to know what the first step to, to, to overseas missions is, it's getting a passport. Amen? You're not going to go overseas if you don't have a passport. You may think, they, you, you may think that you can do that, but trust me, you will not leave the United States. I have seen people try. It's always amazing. Like, wow, what did you think that you were going to do? Like, Huh. I just, it's puzzling. Anyway, let's stand. You got it? As we go through this series, we're gonna, we're gonna turn um, towards processes and opposition and what it looks like to bring things to completion. So there's a, there's a track we're running on. But the first step, the, 
as the G.I. Joes say, knowing is half the battle. Um, that is, you know, discovering what it is that God has for us really is key to knowing what to do next. You can't, you can't take the next step until you know that one thing. And so, Jesus, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your, your leading and your guiding. We thank you for the voice of the Holy Spirit that's in our lives. The voice that touches our hearts, the voice that speaks to our ears, that gives us a, a vision of what could be. Would you, Holy Spirit, come and rest upon us? Help us to discover the good work that you have for every one of us. Help us to, to know what it is. As Paul says in Romans chapter 12, uh, lead us, Holy Spirit, in the, the, the transformation of our minds, the renewal of our minds, so that we would, we would be able to test and know the pleasing and acceptable will of the Lord. Transform us, God. We thank you. Some of you are here today and you and think you just need to be, you need to be touched by the Lord and you need to be healed. You've got some wounding from the way that calling has been abused in your life, the way you've been manipulated. I just, I believe that the Lord wants to touch you. Our ministry team is down front uh, after service and I just invite you to come and pray for them or uh, let them pray for you. But I um, also had uh, just before service uh, the sense that um, somebody here with some stomach issues kind of in, in the, the central part, maybe right where the esophagus, or not the esophagus, the, yeah, the esophagus meets the stomach. Um, is that right? No, that's not right. Yes, that's right. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a practitioner. Just thank you, Jesus. Um, and so I just believe there's some healing. A carpal tunnel too. Um, and uh, I think there was another one, like the left arm. So, knee, the left knee, yeah. So this is the ministry team. Um, wants to pray for you, wants to bless you. Um, otherwise, God bless you this week. And uh, we'll see you next week. Amen. <laughs>